Hello, everyone. I am Olga Sivievich, the Head of Investor Relations at Village Global. Our guest today is Lauren Gu. Lauren is the founder of Recharge Capital, a multi-strategy thematic-first investment firm. It started as a family office, and then it partnered with leading operating businesses across the world, specific to their thematic focus, to help differentiate themselves across deal generation and investment value add. In today's conversation, we will talk about current themes that Lauren is focused on, which include women's health, semiconductors, and digital assets. We'll also talk about geopolitical trends and their impact on the investing strategy at Recharge and global entrepreneurship trends. Lauren, welcome to Village Global Podcast. Thank you, Olga, for having me. Uh, let's start with um, talking a little bit about the history of Recharge Capital. Tell us how you got started and what Recharge is today. Sure, happy to. When Recharge was first built in 2016, uh, it was really built as with the mentality of having a differentiated private investment holding company. Unlike the typical firm where people like to characterize them as you know, either a private equity focus, hedge fund focus, credit focus, or venture focus fund, uh, we really wanted to be able to express our long-term thesis across the entire capital stacks. So we kind of, you know, went across the different major trends that we're looking at and studying and narrowed down to about seven trends where we believe there are 30 to 40 year multi-decade tailwinds behind. And as we map those out, we wanted to fill in the blanks. So how do we fill in the blanks? We believe that a global approach and uh, all cross capital stack approach is very necessary. So what we end up doing is basically figuring out the right managers or right investment opportunities across public, private, venture, credit uh, for each of those seven trends, uh, which resulted in us with both a direct portfolio of over 70 holdings, as well as a fund portfolio of over 140 plus GPs. And then uh, in about 2019, um, as we started to think about the next chapter of Recharge Capital, uh, we were very much inspired by the capability of some of the specialized fund managers that we worked with who had very unique competitive advantages. So we further narrowed down to three particular themes where we found we had very unique access to operating businesses that are highly influential on a global scale. So the three sectors we end up doing are semiconductors, uh, women's healthcare was a particular focus on fertility, and fintech was a particular focus on the future of blockchain adoption. Uh, so for each of those, we were able to identify the right investment teams, back the investment teams, and then really groom them to become an institutionalized practice for each of those strategies. Excellent. And we'll go um, more into some of the specifics around your investment strategy a little bit later, but thank you for that introduction. Um, so one of your mentors was David Swenson. And for some of our listeners who may not be as close to the world of um, asset allocators, David Swenson was the chief investment officer of the Yale Endowment. He is one of the greatest investors, and one of his contributions to the world of investing was inventing what is now called the endowment model, which basically says that if you're a long-term investor, then you don't necessarily need liquidity in every part of your portfolio. And because you're able to harvest a liquidity premium by allocating to strategies such as private equity and venture capital, you can actually earn a much higher rate of return over time by having a lot of the exposure to alternatives. A huge star in the investing world, and it must have been really amazing to get a chance to spend time with him at the beginning of your career. So what are some of the key insights that you learned from David, which still ring true today? And have there been any of the frameworks that you changed as opportunity set evolved? Sure, of course. I think there are four main things that David really, really went into beyond just a framework of endowment style investing. Number one uh, is the place of emphasis on qualitative measurement, uh, the qualitative measurement of the people who are doing the investing. Um, so, you know, historically, when people look at fund evaluations, there's a lot of time being spent on, you know, the past track record, um, the uh, deal underwriting memos, the uh, expertise a manager has on um, the industry they're investing in. Um, but 
not enough is actually spent on the qualitative side of how does the person make the decision? What is the primary motivation of the person? Is this person actually smart enough? Is the raw intelligence really beyond the competitor's head? And those are all very important questions that actually perhaps determine more of the outcome than all the other things combined. Um, David had this mentality that, you know, if you have a really smart person, uh, no matter how tough the situation gets and how bad the situation gets, uh, they'll always come on top. So being able to really understand the qualitative aspect of that is very, very important. Uh, the second part is the distinguishment between a short, medium, and long-term conviction. Um, so to Olga, as you mentioned, uh, you don't need liquidity from all pockets of your portfolio, uh, but that is actually tied to how you have developed conviction across different timelines. So for the shorter term convictions, uh, of course, you will have a higher liquidity needs. For the medium term, you can have a hybrid. And for the longer term, obviously, you can really become the patient capital. And being able to distinguish between the level of conviction and being able to swiftly adjust your conviction based on the new data set being made available, very, very important. And the third part is the capability of cross-corroboration and the power of bringing smart but opposite minds together. Um, I think, you know, part of the key advantage that he had is he had this huge network of the brightest and the most brilliant managers. And of course, when a new star is on a radar, it's very easy to cross-corroborate. And that is very, very critical in the evaluation process to not just understand the quantitative part, but also the qualitative part. But one other thing that's really interesting is given the large portfolio of managers they have, sometimes on the same issue or on the same trend, two managers might hold completely polar opposite opinions. And he would identify those polar opposites and really bring them together and debate it out. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be one convincing the other, but during that debate process, a lot of new information would come out. And sometimes when certain information are missed by one manager, like they'll be able to catch up. So that is very, very important in terms of like the fostering process of the managers as well. And I'll continue for the fourth point, which is the process of really understand how a firm or an investment management company work. So from operationally, how does it look like? But also most importantly, from an investment making perspective, who are the key decision makers and who is the decision maker every step along the way that eventually gets a key decision made? Uh, being able to really understand how those nodes really help them to evaluate the robustness of the investment process. Um, so those four points, I would say, are very, very special to how we've developed our evaluation uh, metrics as well. If there's one thing that we are a little bit different is, of course, I think if you look at the endowment model, uh, they're still much more focused on the asset class first allocation strategy. Uh, whereas, you know, as we sort of think about the future, we believe that, you know, if you pick the right theme, when the market is good, uh, the theme will obviously outperform the index. When the market is bad, the fundamental trend and demand of those underlying businesses will help the company weather through the storm. And so the way that we've really um, think about investment is we've reoriented the priorities. So really being like thematic first and geography second and asset class third, as we believe that asset class are actually getting blurrier and blurrier uh, as managers been drained to each other's territories. Um, so that part, uh, we took a little bit deviation from the traditional model, but I would say the other four things I've mentioned before are properly baked into how we evaluate uh, investment opportunities, both for direct holdings as well as managers. So this is actually a perfect segue in what I was going to ask next, but you invested in over 100 venture capital PE and hedge fund managers and startups across different geographies. Um, and um, you know, you've mentioned some of the key parts of the framework of how you think about choosing um, the best fund managers and entrepreneurs. But are there any, you know, specific examples maybe you can give us, like, for example, you talked about choosing the smartest people. So what are some of the non-obvious ways in um, how you 
listen to what they say and how you make that decision and evaluate or some of the other specifics, which maybe you started adding to your own framework over time as you were investing in more and more managers? Yeah, sure. So obviously, like investing in managers and investing in direct companies are very different. And even in di- investing in direct companies, depending on the stage of companies, your evaluation metrics will be different. But there's one shared rule uh, for us in terms of evaluation process, whether that's on the direct investment team or on the fund investment team, which is how do we, again, evaluate the raw intelligence and motivation and how these two translate into the unfair competitive advantages. So again, we spend a lot of time really understanding every key decision maker's thought process and where they were in their formative years, where they are now, and how will their past environment or current environment influence their decision and risk-taking processes. Um, I think, you know, Olga, we've talked a little bit before about sort of the five soul-searching questions uh, I always ask when, when, you know, we're about to make a big commitment, whether that's to a fund or to a company. Uh, And those questions really edge around their ego, their insecurities, um, their definition of virtual and vice in life, their wish for legacy after death, uh, as well as their relationship with the people around them. So those questions have nothing to do with their professional capabilities or investment expertise, but it really paints a very interesting picture of how this individual within a bigger organization is functioning and how this individual is interacting with investments they're making through their psyche and their thought process. And then, of course, when it comes to um, you know, funds investments. Uh, for larger funds with our thematic focus, we tend to find, you know, managers who are slightly more asset class focused because we believe that those are the wave makers who are able to do major deals. And we do have a strong preference for smaller funds, actually. Uh, we like the very niche focus sector specialist funds that can be nimble and creative in terms of financial engineering and sometimes have capabilities of navigating across different capital structures. And those are also tend to be the managers where we would invest in GP and really foster them to grow into a bigger organization uh, should the opportunity exist. So I want to go back to the soul searching questions. Um, Were there any memorable instances of the way people responded to some of these questions? And you don't have to name names, but just maybe a story of like a really unusual or interesting answer. So I can give you uh, both a positive example and negative example. Uh, And the negative example is actually very quick in terms of weeding out people. So the first question I've always asked people uh, is, do you consider yourself a good person or a bad person and why and how do you draw a line? Most people will, you know, naturally just say, yeah, of course I consider myself a good person. Uh, but then when it comes to why, a lot of times there's very plain vanilla answers to it that doesn't really have any real thoughts behind how one draws a line between good versus bad or how one draws a line of determining good versus bad for the outside parties versus for him or herself. Uh, So that question really brings out a lot of the thought analysis and self-introspection process of an individual. Um, So, yeah, so that's like, you know, a way of like really determining the level of sophistication of someone almost. Uh, And the most memorable answer also came out of this question, right? Uh, We had uh, one founder who very comfortably admitted that he considers himself a bad person and he considers himself a bad person, not because he's, you know, committed to anything bad, but because he felt that his natural inclination for doing things when being provoked are not necessarily the altruistic motive and nor should any human have a necessary altruistic motive for everyone. Uh, But to him, it is because of the conditioning and the education that groomed him to make the right decisions. But his natural instinct was not necessarily the most benign. And in that, you know, he has a very high bar for himself and he considered himself a bad person. That was a very interesting answer and just shows, you know, the level of self-introspection, but also the bar that he holds for himself, which gives a lot of comfort in terms of discipline 
uh, of both personal life and professional life. And as prove it out, uh, the person went out to become a very successful startup founder, um, very disciplined, never really quite distracted, always had this sense of gratitude and appreciation for people around him and for the help he's got. And, you know, that was a very interesting observation years after having asked that first question. Um, I love it. It's a, it's a great framework. Um, and, and I'm sure you have a lot more of these excellent stories to share um, some other time. But let's um, let's talk a little bit about the thematic investing approach. Um, you know, I always find this to be a very interesting topic because in many cases, when people talk about thematic investing, it's just a marketing gimmick, right? They just group their investments in different categories and kind of put catchy themes on top of them. While in reality, thematic approach is inherently constraining, right? There are certain things you want to have exposure to, and there are certain things you want to hedge. And so then you need a much broader toolkit across, in your case, you can go across asset classes, you can do fund direct, direct investing or company direct investing or incubation and you know many other ways in which you implement your views. So having now been running your overall portfolio under this thematic investing framework for a number of years, what are some of the things which in practice proven to be the most challenging ones? And then what are your general reflections on the advantages and disadvantages of this approach? Sure. Um, I think, you know, thematic investing, for sure, there's a lot of marketing buzzes around it. Um, but when we think about thematic investing, we actually take it to a much more granular level. So when we say, you know, say women's healthcare or even semiconductor, we then really deep dive into what are the specific value chains within each of those sectors that number one, there's inv enough investable assets. And number two, there's enough of a market size. And number three, there's right amount of partners and competitions. So you know, the value chain needs to be very, very narrowly focused that allows us to develop fully fledged thesis around this value chain. And then we spend a lot of time, sometimes multiple years to develop the thesis of, hey, those are the type of companies that should exist on this value chains. What are the different ways we can play this value chain? Uh, are those, some of the companies already public? Are some of the companies in private? Are some of the company not existing yet? Do we have the right resources to actually incubate some of those to complete the value chain? Um, what are the missing pieces where you know we need to chime in to complete either a closed loop ecosystem or make the sector and value chain more efficient? So that is our granular approach within a bigger thematic focus. I would say like a big part of the challenge is the public market perception, right? Because Every now and then, there's always a sector rotation in a public market, and that does not necessarily change the trends of the underlying sectors and businesses, but it does impact investors' confidence and deter or sometimes demoralize top entrepreneurs from entering that sector. For us, if enough conviction is developed around the business model, uh, this actually becomes a very interesting time to invest because if we have the right talent identified, we have the right amount of fry powder to really help fuel this growth, then you're basically entering a very much unsaturated market with very little competition. Uh, and that is very good compared to the bull market where, you know, the hot sector might be filled with a lot of noises, smokes, and mirrors. So the public market is a double-edged sword uh, when it comes to thematic investing. Makes sense. And it's been an active environment for fund secondaries in the last year or so. Um, and I know that you've been spending time exploring such opportunities. Um, can you give us an update on fund secondaries markets? What types of discounts you are seeing, particularly for venture capital funds? And how do you think about secondaries versus fund and company direct opportunities in the current environment? Yeah, I think structured deal secondaries are happening quite actively across the board for both funds as well as you know venture companies directly. For funds, we've been seeing you know forty five cents to seventy cents on a par, and for companies, you know direct equity stock, we've been seeing thirty cents to ninety cents on the par, uh, which is a bigger range and wider range. Um, I think you That's know it's a function of you know the case of the fund, like which year of the fund maturity it's in and company stage. 
Or, um, you know, is there any other sort of takeaways? Is it more in the case of funds, sort of, you know, top tier funds versus second tier? Um, are there any general insights? So vintage plays a very big role in that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, um, I think people are really going down to analyze the composition of the fund portfolio uh, and basically underwriting each position on its own, which is a lot more work, but technically it's the right way of doing it. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity for smart eyes. Uh, but obviously, like within that, um, there are definitely a lot of companies that are not marked to value to zero, but are technically worth zero. Um, so discount airing on the safer side um, is definitely a buyer's market environment for now. Yep. So let's talk about um, the current themes that you're focused on. Um, You know, tell us about why you chose a specific theme, maybe share some of the interesting um, numbers, statistics about it, and how you implement it. And let's start with women's health. Yeah, sure. Um, Women's health has been very interesting. So women's health was further narrowed down from our more general healthcare thesis. Um, Obviously, healthcare is perhaps one of the most important aspects in not just the investment world, but also people's daily lives. Um, And there's a lot of interesting inefficiencies that are different across the international geographies. Um, So we've been looking a lot in terms of therapeutics. We've been looking a lot in terms of um, diagnostic. We've been looking a lot in terms of service providers, of course, which actually tends to be the bottleneck for most of the markets. Um, But as we were looking and investing in a lot of those things, uh, one particular sector really broke out in terms of performances, growth, demand, and the ease of customer acquisition almost. And that is women's healthcare. And that even further into it was particularly around fertility. Um, so the f- interesting thing about that is, you know, you have three trends really working behind it, right? Um, this woman empowerment movement is blowing across the world. Uh, A lot of younger women, millennials, Gen Zs, really don't want to have a choice between family and professional life. And being able to freeze their eggs early on is really getting rid of that bio clock that's taking for them and giving them a form of life insurance. Uh, And number two, in a globally declining birth rate environment, families just want to have more control over the outcomes of their children. Um, So if people are able to spent money to run a very scientific process to make sure the children are born completely healthy, a lot of people are electing to do so, which has driven um, the elective IVF rate um, quite rapidly upwards. Uh, And the third thing is, again, this is part of the things where we spend a lot of time figuring out, as you have a growing demand across all different social economic classes, the current IVF practice needs to be cater to more social economic affordabilities. So right now, at least in the US uh, or in some of the key developed markets, it is very expensive and it's really only for the top 1% or even less. Um, So how do you synergize with perhaps international medical service providers, with more at home service providers, uh, with more uh, advanced technologies to increase the single cycle IVF success rate while decreasing the cost of doing so. Um, and given that there are strong international costs and regulatory arbitrages, uh, it is fragmented enough of a market uh, and it's difficult for any one player to piece it together. So we think that it makes sense for an investment fund who has a global approach with you know different offices in different continents to really streamline this theme and figure out how can we piece together an international network of service providers and technologies to better the access as well as uh, success rate of IVF. And with that, you can then extend into the overall um, women's healthcare uh, full cycle wellness, given that fertility is perhaps the most important decision in a woman's life. And once you have the trust from that, you can have the trust for a lot of the other things. Yep. And um, last time you shared some of the really interesting statistics um, around this sector about, you know, the scale of the demand or cost differences or some of those things. Um, can you can you maybe share some of those numbers with us um, as a sector specialist? You have a unique perspective. Um, on yeah, that. for sure. 
Um, I think, you know, there are a couple very interesting stats. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot of people might not be aware, but in Mexico, um, 20 to 23% of her annual cycles nowadays are actually American medical tourists uh, who couldn't afford the IVF process in the U.S. and need to cross a border um, with, you know, a cheaper option. But cheaper option doesn't necessarily mean bad option. Uh, actually, a lot of them have uh, U.S. trained, educated uh, doctors. Uh, some of the facilities are actually brand new and you know, more well equipped than some of the US counterparts. Uh, it is really just a difference in healthcare system that created this cost arbitrage. And then in Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, it's also very interesting. Um, the Southeast Asia market is a multi fragmented market, given that people would always tend to start their experience in Singapore, given that is where it's perceived to have the highest medical standard. Um, but as people go through the customization needs, say, you know, people want to do genetic testing, people want to do gender selection, uh, that has to be done in Malaysia, where it's legally allowed. And if people want to do surrogacy, they have to travel to Thailand. Um, and that fragmentation has really created a lot of inefficiencies in the market. And that is one thing where we believe we'll have a tremendous opportunity to solve. And Southeast Asia is also a net beneficiary of China's export of medical tourism. Uh, so China every year exports between 300,000 to 500,000 cycles of IVF, uh, which is about the same size as the total U.S. domestic cycle. Um, so that amount of cycles, most of which go to Southeast Asia because of the physical proximity, language similarity, as well as cost advantages, um, really is a big market for it to be streamlined and well-developed. Let's move to the second theme of um, semiconductors. There's been a lot going on in that sector recently. So tell us about how you think about the opportunities in the sector and where you're active. Sure. Uh, I think semiconductor has obviously been the hot topic for the last two, three years during COVID because of the supply chain disruptions. Uh, but at the same time, if you talk to a lot of the investors, you end up with either very, very sector specialist uh, who sees semiconductors still as a very cyclical business, or you have people who are like, hmm, it is important, but it's too technical for us to understand, so we probably just stay out of it. For us, semiconductor enablement thesis is actually not a semiconductor thesis purely. It is more of a geopolitical thesis. Uh, so because of this geopolitic um, development between U.S. and China primarily, uh, we see a lot of the semiconductor companies, especially the larger conglomerates, being squeezed in the middle of those two superpowers. And they were forced to pick sides. Uh, and it's very difficult for a company to do so because a lot of them have revenue exposure to both, uh, to both countries. Um, so we found that there's a very interesting opportunity where you can convince and help larger companies to spin off assets uh, that are either one side facing or the other side facing so that they can be more relieved from the superpower squeeze in the middle. Um, so the spin-off and carve-out is a very key aspect of our direct investing strategy for semiconductors. So we tend to, again, identify a single value chain. We look at you know the different sub-business units in larger businesses and see if we can convince them to spin up the units combine some units together to form a new company uh, along the same value chain uh, that has very strong cash flow, has existing customer data uh, and relationships, and has you know, very strong order flows that's coming in multi-year contracts, and then try to create new forms of holding companies based on that. Um, so that's where we're spending a lot of time in Asia, particularly Taiwan, Korea, Japan, um, and a little bit in Vietnam, um, to really develop uh, a number of those holding company uh, opportunities. So we recently had Ian Brammer on the show, and one of his most contested views is that he does not think there's going to be a significant escalation of the conflict between U.S. and China. What's your take on the topic if you um, if you have a direct view? So I think, you know, it's always a very fluidic situation. Uh, from an ideology perspective, of course, uh, the two countries are very different, but the two countries are also so interlinked in terms of trade, commerce, finance, that you will never have a full split. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that technology would also not have a full split. In fact, uh, the recent uh, policies issued by the U.S. is really, really trying to um, forbid technology outflows to China, as well as even to the degree of forbidding talents to outflow to China. Uh, so in that, with that in mind, what we can expect and it's very likely to happen is you know, China and the U.S. will end up with developing their own sets of technology standard, uh, whether that's along semiconductors or sometimes perhaps even biotechs. Um, so what you end up having is the rest of the world will perhaps have to choose which technology standard to follow. And that kind of segregation in terms of technology um, will create for investors more investable assets because uh, you know you have basically brand new companies that are built on top of oper new operating systems. Um, <clears throat> but for the consumers, uh, it is definitely becoming going to become more inefficient and expensive. So that part, um, we don't have a very optimistic view about. Yeah, which of course we're already seeing that with, for example, COVID vaccines, right? Exactly. Um, so let's move to the third theme, um, which is fintech and specifically digital assets. Um, given that one of the investment strategies um, under the recharge umbrella is um, a crypto hedge fund, um, you've certainly had a front row seat to what's been happening in the sector, both on the illiquid equity side and um, liquid currency opportunities. So what's your take on events in crypto in 2022? You know, where, um, what do you expect to be the next wave of innovation? And um, when should we expect the crypto winter to be over? Well, I think it's very hard to say when the crypto winter is going to be over. I think, you know, we definitely witnessed some bad actors uh, in this unregulated space where people thought, you know, ideology was enough to power a lot of those smart people to push for a new standard, but clearly uh, monetary incentive was stronger and was able to corrupt that ideology. Um, so I think a lot of institutions are scared for the right reasons and a lot of investors are scared for the right reason. Um, so I think it's very hard to say when the winter is over, um, but I think with the next wave of innovation that is really going to be centered around what does the so-called blockchain technology uh, really provide. Uh, and that will need to prove real-world use cases. Um, and I think that real-world use cases will be built around two main axes. Uh, number one is, you know, through the actual efficiency and utility improvement, whether that's remittances, settlements, exchanges, et cetera. And number two is the capability of bringing liquidity and transparency to opaque niche real-world assets that are not so easily transactional uh, in the current financial system. The next um, question I want to ask is around geopolitics. So during your recent talk at Peterson Institute, you talked about the rise of techno-nationalism, participation as a capital provider in the national self-reliant technology programs, and the threat of techno-feudalism. Can you unpack these concepts for us, how you think about them, and what they mean for you as a capital provider? Yeah, sure. I think we kind of touch a little bit on this when we discuss about the semiconductor um, thesis that we have and how we're playing in it. But um, let's just sort of take a little bit of a step back of, you know, theorizing or frameworking what techno-nationalism really is, right? So the current wave of techno-nationalism, um, you know, as it happened in about 2017, 2018, um, it's really uh, built around two things, right? Number one is um, countries realize that multipolarized trend will not be easily reversible. And number two is when those kind of trends are not easily reversible, uh, you have real national security risk. So that national security risk could be much beyond just semiconductor. It could be biotech, uh, which will have demographic data and allows for uh, very specific attacks. It can be even climate, uh, as you know, that controls a significant part of the well-beings of the citizens in a particular country. So with those in mind, companies, uh, sorry, countries will really start to think about what would mean to develop their national self-reliant technology programs and what would actually take to develop those national reliant technology programs. So I would say 
there are four axes uh, or four pillars when you think about uh, the successful programs to be implemented by a country. So you have to have incentivized talents, you have to have the appropriate resources, you have to have the agile and sometimes forgiving regulatory environments, and then you have to have the interest aligned capital. So basically everything has to be star aligned. So the natural tendencies for technology innovation will be to become global winners. Uh, but when the government plays those kind of restrictions, then the attractiveness to both domestic and foreign capital for a country wishing to do so will really stem from whether there's enough of an economic return from a specific market, right? So if you take this a little bit further, what that means is you will basically realize that this whole idea of developing national self-reliant technology program is only feasible for a few countries. Mm -hmm. It's only feasible for countries that have either a huge population or a much higher spending powers. Those will have definitive advantages and the gaps between those more tech capable and less capable countries will widen more rapidly. So we're not saying it's only going to be US and China. What we're saying is you look at countries that have those kind of natural edges, uh, that could be Israel, that could be Singapore, that could be Saudi Arabia, uh, those will have the opportunity to develop their own technology standards and even become their own tech powerhouses. Uh, and in the future, technology will play a disproportionately more influential role than uh, the population or uh, geographical size of the country in terms of the ranking power of the world. Um, so many countries will actually be left with no chance of developing their domestic technology programs. And then they will basically have to latch on to one of those tech power hubs uh, in order to uh, get access to uh, those technologies being developed, uh, perhaps also under very unfair terms. And this is what we refer to as essentially a new form of tech feudalism. And so how do you think about it as a capital provider? Then do you, um, you know, do you sort of align yourself with some of these players more? Do you try to participate in multiple opportunities? Um, how should capital providers think about this? So I think, you know, if you are really thinking about it from the perspective of purely financial return, uh, then what is really interesting is you definitely end up with a bigger playground to invest in because now you have, you know, multiple technology standards possibly emerging. You have uh, multiple uh, companies uh, in spread across different countries or different hubs that are building similar products that can all become very useful and be adopted to a, a sizable enough of a market. Um, so what you end up having from an investment perspective is you have lower uh, absolute value in terms of returns, but more opportunities for hits or more return successes. Um, so from an investor perspective, I think you know this is actually one of the more interesting time to really take on a global approach uh, as geopolitics becomes such a major driving force for uh, behind innovation at the same time being a major obstacle for innovation. Mm -hmm. However, I think it is also fair to say that a lot of investors choose to invest in markets where the values align. Um, and I think that has no, that is absolutely correct as well. And it's very much of a personal choice or a firm's choice. You are technically limiting yourself to specific market, but that doesn't mean that the specific market doesn't produce a type of return multiples that you want. Uh, you end up with more concentrated portfolio and that is geographically and that is also perfectly fine. So it kind of just goes to whether you want to have a more index global play or you want to have more of a concentrated local geography play. Yep. Similar to Village Global, Vcharge Capital is a network-focused firm. Can you tell us more about the network that you build at Vcharge, how you collaborate with members of the network, and what are the things in your view that people don't understand about or don't appreciate as much about network building? Yeah, so for us, I think our networks are really centered around three tiers. Um, we have a network of operating businesses, which are very critical as we create new thematic strategies, um, you know, whether that's, you know, the current ones we have around FinTech, women's healthcare, and semiconductors, what the future ones or what we will have. Those 
operating businesses provide very concrete value add that an investment team simply cannot quite do so. Investment teams can be really good at identifying trends, analyzing market, uh, doing investment underwriting. But when it comes to the actual commercialization, technical bottleneck solution, distribution, it is very hard for an investment team to do so. So having those kind of large operating business with existing well-oiled machine um, of mechanisms for prototyping, for doing business deals, for doing uh, engineering solutions, uh, that is a very measurable value add for a lot of those portfolio companies. Um, and that definitely becomes an edge uh, in terms of convincing companies to take our investments, but at the same time, fast track the growth of the portfolio companies. The second tier that we have is what we call the industry expertise. Um, so I think a lot of times uh, the industry expertise are not necessarily in the investment field, but they have very clear sense and good market understanding of what kind of technology or what kind of business services needs to be provided. What exactly is the bottleneck of a sector? Uh, and sometimes that bottleneck will not look so sexy in terms of a business perspective, but it's very much in demand. And you don't really have those until you have those people, you have those experts who you can talk to and really converse with and understand their on the ground practicing experiences. So those are people that we surround ourselves with quite a lot as well. And the third layer we have is what we call a network of investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, we call this a talent reservoir because especially given the fact that we have the incubation program uh, and the fact that we, as we scale companies, a lot of times new talents are needed. Uh, we really look for the talents from the investor community as well as the entrepreneur community that we have. Uh, you'd be surprised some of the investors can be really good operators and because they've seen the mistakes of a lot of companies in the same space, they really know what are the red lines not to cross and what are the paths of least resistance. Uh, so we've actually had pretty interesting successes from poaching investors, turning them into entrepreneurs or key operators. Yep. And what's your media diet? How do you stay on top of the most important trends? What do you like to read, listen to? Um, how do you keep yourself informed? Yeah, so I think, you know, obviously, like the conventional suspects, New York Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, institutional investors, you know, those things are sort of standard in terms of just getting the uh, overall general macro news update. And I follow a lot of macroeconomic blocks uh, because it's always very interesting to see either the academics or researchers debating about where they think the world's is going uh, and have their opinions about how the central banks or the governments are thinking about uh, navigating out of either a nasty situation or thinking about stimulating the economy. Um, there's one particular blog that I really enjoy. It's called The Notes on the Crisis. The, the writer, Nathan, um, was a self-taught economist and um, his analysis is very sharp. And he's got a very interesting followings, including some of the Fed bankers um, who would actually engage in pretty intellectual debates with him. And he'll report us out. So that one, I highly recommend. The key thing for me, though, is actually the regional news. Um, so given that we have a global operation, uh, I try to read a lot of global uh, regional news, uh, whether that's you know, local Singaporean news, local Malaysian news, local, you know, even Spain, Spanish news, local um, Portuguese news, just to understand, you know, the companies that we have in those markets, are there any interesting tailwinds or headwinds uh, around them? Obviously, some of those will require translation services, uh, but I think it is very important to have that local perspective and understand and try to understand and appreciate the nuance from a local reporter's perspective or local media's perspective, rather than seeing everything through the American lens. And let's conclude this conversation on one of my favorite topics. Um, but one of your interests and passions is art. So tell us about your collecting history, um, what how you think about art and what are some of the things that you appreciate about it, which may not be obvious to others? Yeah, sure. Uh, it is indeed one of my favorite topic to talk about as I see that as my uh, salvation uh, from my day-to-day uh, -day work life. 
So my collecting history started uh, in my freshman year of college. And since then, I felt like from the very beginning, I had a very strong emotional connection to the surrealism movement. Uh, perhaps it was because growing up, I felt like I was never um, a kid left fit in, uh, given that I traveled a lot to different countries. Uh, I was always a third culture kid and I always seeked for a place of escape or a moment of escape. And the surrealism works really um, spoke to me in that way. Um, so I collected about four years of the modern masters uh, from De Caracol, Magritte, Ernst uh, onwards. And then when I moved to New York, uh, I was exposed to this wonderful scene of contemporary art and I carried on with the lineage of surrealism. And what has been really interesting is that if you look at some of the most interesting and inspiring contemporary surrealist artists nowadays, they also have this kind of similar escapism mentality uh, as the old masters had in the early 1900s. Uh, and I think what has been really interesting is a lot of those artists tend to be minority artists, uh, where they are channeling out their frustration and anger uh, about the injustice uh, and inequality of the society through their work pieces. And those work pieces render beautifully, but provoke a lot of thoughts around it. Uh, and I think those are somewhat very thematic as well. Uh, you know, we, I kind of carry this thematic approach to art collecting, where we, I find supporting and collecting artists who have a very strong message to say, and that message can potentially transcend across time and generations that still be distilled as an essence to be very, very exciting. Uh, and of course, there's the part that, you know, art collecting generates um, a lot of additional perspective on life, unlike the typical finance investment um, environment uh, artists a lot of them, once you get to know them, uh, they're very pure, they're very perfectionist. Um, they really understand um, the personal message they're trying to send out. Uh, they do not have necessarily uh, a big ambition of living uh, a mark on art history, but they feel them as you know, adding the bricks to the wall. And that kind of uh, dedication, craftsmanship, and pursuit of excellence uh, are really soothing uh, in uh, for a person who works in a very fast-paced environment for finance. Yeah, I've always found that the biggest um, difference between how artists think about the world and um, and perhaps the rest of us is the long-term focus, right? Most of the artists have focus that is truly beyond their lifetimes and, um, and, and they live by it and they create work with that expectation in mind. And I find that on the investing side, you know, if you consider yourself a 10 plus year investor, you think of it as very long-term, right? While in the broader context of history, that, that may not even be enough to sort of digest and understand what's happening in society today. So thank you so much for joining our podcast today. It's been um, great to discuss all of these topics with you from thematic investing to art. Um, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Olga. Okay.